Um, okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to SOAS for this uh, special event on representing the Philippine uh, Cordillera. Uh, I'm uh, Professor William Clarence Smith. I teach history here. I do research on the history of the Philippines, uh, mainly on uh, migrants from the Middle East and um, South Asia. Um, my own particular interest in this region is in uh, gold mining and the so-called Syrian <coughs> involvement in the investing in the gold mines uh, in the historical period, in the American period, in fact. But I'm also interested in uh, pre-colonial gold mining. So if anybody knows about that, I'm interested particularly in the technology and in the way in which <coughs> technology shifts both in the Spanish period and in the <coughs> uh, American period. Um, I have to tell you um, a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, there are bathrooms on this floor, and on every floor, in fact, um, and hopefully well signposted. And you've got the emergency exits uh, out there. Um, hopefully we won't have to um, use those. Um, okay, and just one final thing is that we're planning um, another event next year uh, on the Philippine South. So we're doing the north now, and we're thinking of shifting to the south next year. So if anybody's interested in contacting Christina, who's the uber organizer of all this, I just sort of front it. Uh, Christina does all the legwork. Uh, please uh, contact her or me, um, and we'll try and do a similar event next year uh, on the uh, Philippine South. And now um, it gives me great pleasure to call on uh, Dr. Anilin uh, Salvador uh, Amores to come and give her uh, keynote uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning, everyone. It's kind of warm. All right. Can you hear me at the back? Good. All right. I'll start now. So thank you very much, uh, SOAS, through Christi, Christi S. and Juan for inviting me here. So it's a pleasure to give this keynote for this uh, particular conference. Uh, today I'm going to talk about re-examining Igorot representation, issues of commodification, and cultural appropriation. At the end of my impassioned talk to a group in Manila late last year about our proposed exhibition titled Fist of Merit, which was slated to be set up at the, at the University, of the Philippine ba University of the Philippines Baguio's Museo Cordillera in February 2018. A well-dressed elderly woman calmly asked, do the Igorots still exist? Are they still dog eaters and headhunters? It was an innocent question, but I almost fell to the ground in disbelief that questions such as this existed in some of my countrymen's minds to this day. In my head, I thought that the, that the old lady was in a time warp. Keeping my composure and demeanor, I replied politely, yes, they do. They are now lawyers, doctors, and educators, and wear the same clothes as we do. Recalling this incident and speaking to you now on the topic representing the Philippine Cordillera, I cannot help but surmise that the colonial stereotypes of the Igorots as headhunters, dog eaters, and savages continue to hound the members of this indigenous community to this day. The Igorot as savage and irrational is a typical Eurocentric statement, and its variations are found in countless documents whose ultimate objective was to project barbarism of native societies and thus to justify their conquest by, a, by the agents of civilization. For instance, is it working? <laughs> okay, for instance, in the 1904 St. Louis Fair, the Bontok Igorots, Kankanaois, and the Tingyans were exhibited in the Igorot village. A photograph of the dog-eating ritual of the Igorots are deeply held in a patently enduring cultural image of the Igorots as the other. Dean Worcester's photograph of a decapitated corpse, of an Igorot warrior being brought to his grave, the tattooed warriors that records their successful warfare, and the bare-breasted women widely echoed 
and purveyed by the colonial project. Colonialism's rhetoric of exoticism also functions to successfully establish boundary between the cultural group of being displayed and the cultural group doing the viewing. As a Kankanayi and an anthropologist, Albert Bakdayan, and I quote, concurs that the Igorots themselves are one of these hundreds of millions of so-called indigenous scattered all over the wor world and thus are familiar in personal experience with the demeaning consequences emanating from otherness. My interest on egret representation, commodification, and appropriation of culture grew out of a range of research in the Cordillera in general and in Kalinga and Ifugao specifically. Egret representation, issues of commodification, and cultural appropriation have been in recent years one of the most widely discussed sources of ethical problems. This is also an ongoing debate on the studies on the Cordillera. The prevalence of these issues indicate the continuing challenge we face in representing Igorot culture. For this presentation, I examine the representation of the Igorots, a popular collective term for the different ethnic groups inhabiting the Cordillera mountain ranges of highland northern Luzon. More recently, they have likewise been referred as BBACs after the acronym for Bontok, Ifugao, ben, bon, Benguet, Apayao, and Kalinga provinces in the Cordillera, which are the domain of these indigenous groups, or Cordillerans, which is considered the politically appropriate term to employ in the light of, indigen of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. Today, they are more popularly known as Igorot UK or Igorota. While the term Igorot was a derogative term in the past, the term is now invoked as a declaration of pride to one's roots and as a, as a means to access resources under the Philippine nation state. In this paper, I would like to address the following questions. How were the Igorots represented in the past? How does this impact the representation today? How do we, how do we represent the Igorots in the contemporary period? And how and in what context are eager cultures commodified and appropriated and what consequences are entailed? Instead of asking who owns culture, when traditional practices are performed in diaspora, we ask how can we promote respectful treatment of native culture and indigenous forms of self-expression within mass societies? What are the challenges we face? And how do we negotiate this to be able to represent the Igorots in the best possible way? What role do museums play in representing the Igorots? Drawing from my own research in the Cordillera, I will first re-examine how the Igorots were represented in the past. This is based on archival research from different repositories and historical documents. Then I will elaborate on how we represent the Igorots in the contemporary period and identify consequences, challenges, and negotiations in representing cultures. I argue the following among many other things. First, the past representations of the Igorots allow us to read them back as we take back the images and provide a glimpse of the figurations of Igorot identity prior to contemporary distortions, such as those engendered by increased encounters with tourists who want to pose, in quotation, pose with authentic, in quotation, natives. These representations provide a venue for critical examination, thank you, to allow for a deeper appreciation and awareness that contributes to the self-determination of the Igorots in the contemporary period. That is making it possible the reclamation of the Igorots as symbols in contemporary discourse and debates on ancestral land claim and ethnic identity. Third, the Igorots as the other in colonial representation can be positively valued in contemporary research, and colonial records have been vital in re-examining how Igorots are represented in the past and how these materials are used in popular modes of representation and recuperation of Igorot identity in the present. 
And lastly, the way these representations contest each other provides an entry into the examination of disjunctions of local and global <coughs> processes, as well as further inter further as well, as well as a further interrogation of authoritative ethnographic representation and anthropological knowledge on the Igorots. Through a case study approach, I examine how these representations of the Igorots are perceived in order to evaluate these representational practices. Given the colonial past of appropriation, commoditization, and stereotyping that persists to the present, it will be discerned that representation of Igorot culture are highly contestable and undergoing change. The findings that I present in this paper indicate that there is a need to address the question on how to represent the Cordillera by critically examining the past and current practices. According to Stuart Hall, the representational system, whether they are sounds, written records, photographs, film, electrically produced images, musical notes, even objects are a means to stand for or signify other people's concepts, ideas, and feelings that exist in a culture. Representation spans semiotic and discursive approaches. The semiotic is concerned with the how of representation, otherwise known as poetics, whereas the discursive approach is more concerned with the effects and consequences of representation or its polities. It examines not only how representation produces meaning, but how the knowledge exerts power, regulates conduct, makes up or constructs identities and sub subjectivities, and defines the way certain things are represented, thought about, practiced, and studied. In addition, there are various mediums where this representation takes place in written works, photographs, commodities, and museum exhibitions, which are all part of the process of representing culture, and what Apadurai and Breckenridge have described as global culture ecumen of the contemporary world. The task is to understand how this have become to represent Igorot culture or have brought Igoratness to the world through a variety of practices and discourses as a hybrid process of cultural reproduction. In particular, when knowledge is rooted in local constructions and exposed to the global world as an empowering representation or an oppressive misrepresentation. The former is brought about by thorough collaboration with the cultural bearers, bearers while the latter is generally brought about by commodification and cultural appropriation with the advent of tourism and modernity among others. The Oxford English Dictionary provides the most basic definition of appropriation as, I quote, the making of a thing a private property, taking as one's own or to one's own use, although what is appropriated will vary in different contexts and situation. What is true in all instances is that something is allegedly taken and some, uses, some use it and some things are made out of it. In the case of cultural appropriation, the taking from a culture that is not one's own of intellectual property, cultural expressions or artifacts, history and ways of knowledge, members of one culture take something from another cultural context and put it to some use within the context of their own culture. Members of the public copy and transform cultural products to suit their own tastes, express their own creative individuality, or simply make a profit. Some cultural products can be freely shared with the public. Others are devalued when appropriated by the majority culture. In these instances, commodification takes place. While commodification and appropriation are seen as negative practices in the contemporary period, Scafidi argues that cultural products do, however, provide a starting point for recognition of the source community as well as a means of al allowing outsiders a degree of participation in and appreci appreciation of that community. Hence, the perspective on commodification of culture is a multivalent one. 
All the commodification of cultural products may indeed be an exploitative or colonialist misappropriation. Cultural appropriation, nonetheless, may also be beneficial to both the source community and to the nation as a whole. Furthermore, I also argue that not all appropriation and commodification from other cultures are morally questionable. Sometimes items and ideas are freely transferred from one culture to another, and the internet has facilitated global spread. The case, for instance, of batok, or the traditional tattoos of the Kalinga, for instance, will serve to illustrate this. Batok involves community-generated and place-based traditional tattoos and practices that have tremendous economic and social value in the village. Yet, when these are appropriated, Buscalan, a remote village in Tinglayan, Kalinga in northern Philippines, as the source community, has little control over the use and spread of its designs. Traditional cultural practitioners, such as Wang Ud, attest that communities of origin are generally unable to prevent the appropriation of their designs through legal action. The potential effects of cultural appropriation on source communities and on the products themselves span the range of destructive effects of misappropriation and the, and the beneficial results of permissive appropriation. I shall discuss this in detail in the latter part of my presentation. Re-examining Igorot representation. How do we define the Igorots? In this section, I will examine how past representations of the Igorots were made and how this have impacts that, have, that persisted to the present. Photographing the Igorots in the lens of Dean Worcester. In 1903 to 1906, Dean C. Worcester, an American colonial official, journeyed through the mountains of the Cordillera in northern Luzon, recording the people's appearance, customs, and material culture. The American colonial administrator, administrators at the time were in need of precise, detailed information about the islands, which they had acquired in 1899, and the different ethnic groups of the colony. For this purpose, they created a, variet, a, variet, a variety of institutions to collect data. One major institution created for this purpose was the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, renamed the Bureau of Ethnological Survey in 1903. Its remit was to report on the conditions of the Muslim and pagan tribes, recommend legislation for their governance, and accumulate data on Philippine ethno ethnology. Worcester, who became the Bureau Chief in 1903, took interest in the archipelago's tribal peoples, particularly the Igorots of northern Luzon, whom he described as, I quote, savages, primitive, and illiterate, though they are perfectly harmless and peaceful and honest people, unquote. Worcester mistakenly used the term Igorot to refer to all the ethno-linguistic groups living in the mountains of the Cordillera, including the Kalinga, Ifugao, Bontok, Isneg, Kankanaoy, and Ibaloy. These groups occupy the areas that are now provinces of Abra, Apayao, Benguet, Ifugao, Kalinga, and the Mountain Province. From his visits to the Cordilleras, Worcester was able to compile an extensive photographic record of ethnic groups, producing about 16,000 black and white photographs taken between 1898 to 1913. In addition to the photographs, Worcester was able to obtain a massive amount of Igorot artifacts and produce a 45-minute film entitled Native Life of the Philippines in 1913 that featured some of the Igorot's way of life, like gong playing, metalsmith, basket weaving, pottery, textiles, among others. The film would reflect on, reflect on his political agenda for the Philippines. The film had celebrated screenings in the, in the United States, and while some lauded the film because of his scientific cum exploration lecture, there were also negative reactions from Filipinos abroad, primarily because of the misrepresentation of the early Filipinos in the film. As such, the film was not screened in theaters in Manila. 
The film was virtually forgotten for over a century until it was recently discovered in the archives of the University of Pennsylvania. So as you can see here in the video, uh, there is uh, Kalinga dancing, which was taken in Lubuagan, Kalinga. Uh, the second row is the mock uh, fighting among the Bontok. And this here is the thigh slapping game that was recorded uh, in Ifugao. Top is, uh, it's like a, a wailing ritual, and they were burying a head of, an, of a beheaded warrior. Uh, but uh, Wurzer has a very limited frame, so he could not uh, uh, capture the entirety you know, of, of that particular uh, uh, ritual. And then below is an Ifugo performance on a wedding ritual in Ifugo. So this is the website where this, you can actually find the film, the snippets of the film at the University of Penn Archives. Recently, I retraced Worcester's path when he recorded the film and brought this film to rev relevant communities in the Cordillera region, in Kalinga, Ifugao, Benguet, and Abra. I conducted a film elicitation to gain more depth in the understanding of the film by bringing in indigenous people's interpretation. The indigenous voice is different from the exploitative description of the images. According to them, it is good to have a record of the past because we refer to them if we are doing it right or wrong. The extensive collection of Worcester's photographs include about 200 of Worcester's photographs of tattooed igorots taken in mugshot style with front and with front and back, with front and profile views against a white background. These photos, many of them published in Worcester's article in the National Geographic entitled Headhunters of Northern Luzon, published in 1912, had an immense political impact, especially since the issue of Philippine independence from colonial rule was revived in 1912. The publication contains 85 photos of tribal Filipinos with an implicit theme of unpreparedness of Filipinos for independence. The photos of bare-breasted women with tattoos of headhunters and even a headless Ifugao serve to showcase not only the colonized subject but also the ethnocentric eye behind the lens that regarded the Igorots as savages, barbaric, and primitive. Since Worcester's approach to non-Christian tribes of the Philippines was based on 19th and early 20th century ideas of race and evolution, his photos reflect paradigms of social evolutionism, racism, and colonial paternalism. However, they also became ethnographic recordings, or I quote, anthropological documentations of people with no written records, which thus became valuable to the American colonial administration. While many aspects of the Igorot photos, many of which were, I quote, staged or deceptively captioned, are disturbing and misleading today, I strongly argue, however, that these photos nonetheless are substantial visual evidence of the Igorot's way of life, and as such are effective in current anthropological research and reclaiming ethnic identity. These images have inspired younger generation of Igorots and ignited their interest in the culture of their ancestors expressed in writings, artworks, tattoos, film, and other forms of media. performing igorotness at the 1904 St. Louis Fair. The Worcester Photographic Collection is particularly important because of the ways of seeing that are represented as it directly fed into a major metropolitan project, the 19th St. Louis Exposition in Missouri, popularly known as the World's Fair. In this fair, sun-dry ethnic groups including the Bontoc, Lipanto, Igorots, and the Tingians were lumped together as the Igorotes and presented as examples of primitive tribes. In Missouri, 
where the World's Fair was held, there was an increased commerce and new social changes. It also highlighted the encounters with new populations since the exposition introduced the Igorots to the world. For instance, the Igorote village was extremely popular with fairgoers and earned high profit for the organizers. Perhaps one of the most sensational highlights of the exhibit that created an enduring image of the Igorots was the staging of the, of the Igorot dog feast, wherein the actual slaughter, roasting, and consumption of a dog was played out. Linguist and an Iboloi, Patricia Ab a fabler recounts how the city of St. Louis Fair supplied some 20 dogs a month from the local pound so that Igorots could perform this titillating spectacle several times a week. Even the dog eating occurs only rarely in traditional Highland culture. Chickens, pigs, cows, and water buffaloes being preferred ritual animals and food sources. The result was the creation of another still powerful stereotype of the Igorot to be placed alongside those that classified them as headhunters, savages, and, savages and freaks. On the other hand, June Prilbret, a bontoc and an eminent scholar of the Cordillera, gives a counter reading about the participation of the bontoc Igorots in the fair. According to her, and I quote, most of the writings to date have focused on the exploitation of the Igorots in the way they were viewed as culturally representing Filipinos. Elite Filipinos denounced the exhibition and had caused them great humiliation. I quote, end of quote. But how did the Igorots perceive themselves? How does this self-perception con contrast with how others represented them? or interpreted these representations. In her interview with the Bontok participants in the fair, such as Kinarang and Takay, the narrative shows that they, are, they desire to go abroad, lured by their own curiosity and thirst for adventure outside of the Ili. Furthermore, they were not entirely passive and resisting subjects as evidenced by how they reacted by using the English language to engage the white man's law and structures of political power when they felt cheated. In other words, there is evidence that opens up to the possibility that their exposure to the world may not have been necessarily resulted in a feeling of being exploited among the eager participants. In fact, as Oliveira concurs that the Igorots at the fair were actually modern day laborers, are a reversion of, of OFWs or OCWs, and their performances had dual effect of making them simultaneously desired and disavowed by their audiences. Needless to say, there were thousands of photographs taken of the Igorots on the exhibit, and this made their way as souvenirs to American homes that eventually served as postcards sent to different places and have become historical records in the archives of colonial encounter. It was also around this time that a series of articles on the Igorots by Dean Worcester was published in the National Ge Geographic magazine in 1911, 1912 and 1913 that imbued him the image of a wild man at home. In fact, there is a photograph found at the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology which is inaccurately labeled as R.F. Barton dancing with a native. It actually shows Worcester as an Ifugal native in the act of the Umunhimung performing a war dance called the Hidit for a ritual and for a burial ceremony in Ifugao. The photograph shows Worcester in a complete garb, wearing a loincloth, a headdress, and brandishing a spear and a shield, along with an Ifugao warrior, performing what he calls a primitiveness of the wild tribes, of the people that he had earlier documented. A similar case of what might, of white, of what might, be, might be referred to as reverse appropriation. The Ifugao master carver and ritual specialist Tagiling of Hapao appropriated the long noses of American colonial officers in their sacred bulor and were sold as souvenir items to visitors. That's Tagiling. Uh, this is the 4th Infantry. And they used the bulol as trophies. And you have long noses, Ibaloy, uh, long noses bulol 
that were sold as souvenir items, such as these ones. A repercussion of this representation is that all of a sudden, the Igorots had to contend with the difficulties of change, and they faced the dilemma of whether to integrate or to retreat further into the mountains to preserve tradition. These new problems were compounded by the increasingly distorted images of themselves and their way of life. Many of these foisted upon them from without and circulated among lowland cultures who did not know any better either. In addition, these photographs have become portable, easily downloadable through the internet. They travel quickly across time and space, and in the process, the intended meanings behind the images also change in the process of movement from one context to another. For example, the colonial administrators took photographs of the egrets for the purpose of asserting hegemony over them. Conversely, it can also be argued that the subjugated people may appropriate the same photographs to reassert their identity and power in the colonial context. In this case, the photograph is transformed into a metaphor of power, having the ability to appropriate and decontextualize time and space and those, and those who exist within it. The photograph perpetuates the past while it is being reproduced or consumed in the present. While one can argue that the photograph is located in the past, and it can also be equally said that the photograph is located in the present. Today, these photographs are highly valued because of the ethnographic content they contain. When we view the significance of these images as a form of Igorot representation and the attached relation to the larger project of the Philippine indigenous cultures towards the articulation of an Igorot identity within the context of the larger national Filipino identity, these images are in fact an honest and faithful documentation of an Igorot culture that contributes to a deeper appreciation of Igorot culture in diaspora, most especially for the younger generation. As they would say, Ah, waday takus awi, sinan am ama, sinan ap apo. Yes, they were the people in the past who were our ancestors. Although these representations are drawn from our own discourse, they are contested by other representation. representations, such what can be discerned in the case of the Kalinga Batok, or traditional tattoos in northern Philippines. Wang Ud Incorporated, how are cultures commodified and appropriated? No doubt, the movement of Wang Ud uh, tattoo-inspired works in the local and international market has generated the rising interest on Kalinga tattoos. My point in this section is to show that production, circulation, and consumption of these objects constitute an important dimension of self-production of Kalinga as well as Igorot culture. For the past months, I have been witness to this uh, phenomenon of how Batok tattoos and Wang Ud have been commodified and appropriated in different forms, in t-shirts, sneakers, coffee labels. I have mugs and wine bottles, but I forgot to include it here. And for the, for the tattooed by Wang Ud movement, the supporters clamor against cultural appropriation of Batok and have raised objections to commodification. What is it that it's being appropriated and commodified? Alternatively, is this not simply a case of cultural imitation or cultural borrowing, or the less offensive term, I quote, creative mixing? When there is an incorporation of traditional tattoos in mainstream tattoos and objects, this is condemned as theft. But it is not more often than not that, not that the native peoples themselves have selectively appropriated symbols from other cultures. It becomes commodification when individuals market restless search for novelty to transform unfamiliar tattoo patterns into exploitable commercial resources. The popularity of tattoos has opened arenas for both traditional and contemporary forms of expression. This associated from the symbolic meanings. Tattoos also have become graphic designs, this devoid of ritual acts. This is due to the influx of tourists to the village in Buscalan since 2014, which burgeoned the 
which burgeoned in 2015 and continues to the present. Most of the younger ones come from Manila, according to Apo Wangud. The other clients are mostly tourists passing through who have heard of her and seek her out for souvenir tattoos. Tattooing of small designs, for instance, on the back, legs, arms, and wrists are quickly done, and the vit visitors bring the tattoos, souvenirs, and representations of selves back to with them to the cities. With the steady flow of tourists in the village to get tattoos, the Tinglayan Tourism Office records more than 500 tourists visiting Wang Ud's village and seeking to be tattooed by her in one day. From January to March 2016, there have been 4,071 tourists and a steady flow of visitors was recorded in the ensuing months. In my recent visit, the arrival of people traveling in groups was constant. They would stay into the village for three days. For each tourist, they pay about uh, 75 pesos or a pound for an environmental fee, and those and they were issued numbers. I observed that there was about more than 100 people who lined up to get tattoos from Wang Ud, Grace Palikas, and El Yang Wigan in their tattoo hut. Many waited until the next day to get the, the tattoos. Once the younger apprentices did the traditional design from the wooden ply board with the two patterns, now mixed with designs from Ifugao uh, and Tikopian designs from Africa, as well as designs derived from Alibata, the Tagalog, uh, Alibata or Baybayin, the old Tagalog script, with various designs and meanings and other interpretations. And then Wang Ud would put the three dots or the tuldok as a form of signature to authenticate the tattoo. Visitors say it becomes more authentic with the Wang Ud signature tattoo. With the vibrant economy spurred on the, con on the quest for authentic tattoos by Wang Ud, an important phenomenon is that local people have begun to patronize the younger tattoo artists in the village and are now getting inked by the same tattoos that they abhorred 40 years ago. The pain, the perforation of the skin, the permanence embodied that experiences to construct individual and social identities through appropriation of the batok resulted in the recontext the contextualization of the tattoos in the present. Today, the very same tattoos associated with headhunting as symbols of savagery, which were criminalized during the American colonial period at the turn of the century, are now ostensibly part of this trend of modern tattoos. Uh, these are the apprentices of Wang Ud, the youngest is a 12-year-old uh, tattoo practitioner. So these tattoos are now uh, appropriated as visible and permanent markers of Filipino identity. So these are the younger uh, tattoo artists, uh, local and foreign tourists would come to get uh, tattoos from the village. And noticeably, the mass production of these tattoos may have gained meaning in contemporary tattoo practices, but have lost the deeper symbolic associations of these tattoos, including the absence of rituals performed on this once sacred and place-based practice. The current phenomenon also implies the repackaging of heritage as a reinvention of tradition rooted in the past. This also changed the landscape of the small and remote village in Buscalan to a place where one can showcase the tattooing as a vibrant culture. So here you can see homestay programs. Uh, the traditional houses are now transformed into inns, inns, eatery, etc. And of course they have, they also sold uh, souvenirs inspired from these uh, tattoos. As Christian Blood Gimlet posits that heritage and tourism are collaborative industries, that heritage converts locations into destinations, and tourism makes them economically viable as exhibits themselves. Anthropologists John Uri and Edward Brunner viewed the commodification of tattoos from a wider perspective, writing that in the tourist gaze, 
Tourists determine the locals' role in meeting their demands and expectations. The hosts comply with these demands because of expectations imposed on them. The host gaze, on the other hand, is the point of view of the locals towards tourism and focuses on the roles and actions of the host community in response to the, in response to the tourist needs and demands. Both local hosts and tourists meet at the tourist border zone when their views are in conflict. The tourists come to get traditional tattoos in Buscalan while the locals earn from their visit. Yet other scholars believe that locals can be active agents by preserving what they want, inventing traditions, all the while remaining cognizant of what is real and what is staged. For instance, last October 21, 2017, a helicopter brought tattoo practitioner Wang Ud from her home village in remote Buscalan in Tinglayan, Kalinga. Uh, Tinga and Kalingit province to Manila for a two-day trade event and people cried, exploitation! What was a nominee of Gawad ng Manilikanang Bayan or the National Living Treasure uh, nominee doing at the Manila Fame at the World Trade Center tattooing people on a cordon off platform, much like the igorots displayed in, during the 1904 St. Louis Fair, people asked. In the same vein, perhaps the question must also be asked when indigenous peoples perform their primitiveness in the cities or in diaspora. Does it also undermine their authenticity? Transplanting what used to be a local tradition and a Kalinga ritual to the big city where cash instead of feats of bravery became the mode of exchange for the experience could be part of what has spurred the outcry. Wang Ud and the rage over tourism and traditional tattoos are examples of what occurs in this tourist border zone as the batok is reinvented and the traditional tattoos' meaning and context have changed. The tattoos have been appropriated as visible and permanent marks of Filipino identity, but their sudden accessibility to about anyone in contemporary times has eroded the deeper symbolic associations, especially in the absence of the rituals performed around, around this one sacred and place-specific practice. In my experience, I argue what occurs in the disjunction of the arenas in which meanings are produced and circulated is more complex than, than commodification and is further complicated by how traditional tattooing as a cultural activity is understood and interpreted. Exhibiting Igorot Culture in Museums, Cultural Appropriation and Protection. How do we represent Igorots in museum exhibitions? What is being represented? represented in museums. The image of the Igorots is derived not only from the assertions of their distinct culture, but also to depict the culture and life ways of the people. It is about objects or material culture as forms of representation that produce meaning through the, the display of objects in ethnographic museums. Ethnographic museums feature objects as the material culture of peoples who have been considered to have been the pro appropriate target for anthropological research. They produce certain kinds of representations and mobilize distinct classificatory systems which are framed by anthropological theory and ethnographic research. In this particular section, I seek to emphasize the importance of creating contextualized presentations of the Igorot culture using multiple per perspectives and interpretative media based on the collaboration with the native people and their respective communities. It will consider representation in the singular the activity or process as well as representations as the resultant entities or products in, in an ethnographic museum whose representational strategies feature the ethnographic objects or artifacts of Igorot cultures. In other words, ethnographic museums have had to address issues of representation in a concerted fashion. For instance, the Museo Cordillera's inaugural exhibition on tattoos in 2017 is one way of directly addressing heritage, challenging the stereotypes of Igorot culture, and empowering local culture, cognizant of the fact that representation of the Igorot culture is a complex process. The issue of how the exhibit 
how of how to exhibit Igret culture and other indigenous groups remains an urgent question, calling for a renewed discussion on representation. So this is our exhibit, uh, inaugural exhibition at the Museo Cordillera on tattoos. We had uh, five mannequins installed in the main exhibition hall representing the tattoos of the Ibaloy, uh, Kalinga, Bontok, uh, yeah, the, only the three, and Ifugao. So this one, we had uh, a visitor, a sixth grader from a Christian school who demanded that we should close the exhibition because we have, I quote, obscene, naked, and unshoed peoples from the past, unquote, in display. Given reaction, uh, reactions such as this, we see that scholarly exhibitions, interpretative exhibit materials, and exhibition publications present opportunities to inform audiences and address misconceptions about Igorot culture. Scholars and curators in close collaboration with indigenous groups being represented in the exhibition help convey the multiple meanings and cultural values, as well as relating it to the historical and contemporary context. So here we work uh, with the communities, the cultural barriers, our researchers and our curators now to present in a accurate way uh, uh, about the, the Igorot culture. For instance, we have other cases uh, such as the Ibaloy, no? uh, where we had to fabricate an Ibaloy mannequin uh, full of tattoos. And these are based on my research on the Ibaloy uh, mummies in Kabayan. So those are the images uh, based on our research on the uh, Ibaloy mummies in Benge. And then we invited Ibaloy elders to come see uh, this mannequin. When they saw the mannequin, which our artists had worked on for two long weeks, they vehemently asked the tattoos to be removed immediately before the exhibition opening. One of the elder remark, one of the elders remarked, I quote, the Ibaloy people are not tattooed. We do not have record of tattoos like those, and pointing at that mannequin, like those criminals because we are God's people. We are Christians. I, Inayan. The word Inayan is like, uh, it's bad, or it's uh, taboo, etc. So uh, that's what they said. So we showed these images, the early drawings of Hans Mayer and the photos of the mummies with tattoos in Ibaloy. And they were relieved no, in disbelief that they have such records. Because the Ibaloy were the first Igorot group that were earlier Christianized and formed resistant, uh, resistance against the Spaniards and educated by the Americans during the colonial period. So this was a challenge that we encountered in representing the Ibuloi in the Museo Cordillera. These are the elders who commented after we explained what the research is all about. And these are clearly uh, presented in uh, the tattoos on the mannequins. As curators, we explained that these tattoos are the evidence of a highly cultured people in the past. So this illustrates how an effective exhibition can improve the status of traditional culture, dispel stereotypes, and facilitate greater understanding of a dynamic nature of culture and the current issues related to Ibalay culture. Presentations developed in collaboration with local people and communities that utilize interpretative materials can increase the significance and accessibility of understanding Ibaloy culture. Contextualizing the Bontok Labkan. In February 2018, the Museo Cordillera opened the, an exhibition titled The Feast of Merit that explored the connection between wealth, status, and feasting in Luzon Cordillera. In the exhibition, we selected objects that would best capture the concept of feasting to reflect the affluence of the Ifugao Kadangyan, the Ibaloy, and Bontok Baknang. 
the curators were careful to ensure that there were decontextualized objects put on display and that these were not sourced using unethical practices of collecting objects in situ. There is one particular ritual objects, object that the Bontok hold as sacred to their celebration of the ritual feast called the Chonno, is uh, the object called Lebkarn. In the village, uh, in, the, uh, in the Bontok Ili, the Lebkan is held sacred and we cannot borrow and bring it out from the village. No? So this is the Bontok Ili. This is one of the uh, this is the Lebkan in the, found in the village. And um, the Lebkan is a long and huge rice mortar cowed carved out of pine log and used during the Chigas segment of the Chonno. The Chigas revolves around the ceremonial threshing of rice using the rod-like pestles called the R.O. The threshing, which is accompanied by singing, is usually performed by women. The Chona feast was last ce celebrated in the 1970s in Bontok Ili and in the 1980s in Samoki. There are several Lebkan mortars used in the past rituals which are kept in the Ator, of the ED. The people hold all of this sacred and taking them out of the community is prohibited. The Libkan of the Misery Cordillera was constructed with the consent of the Bontok elders and requisite rituals were held during its construction. The elders hope that exhibiting the Libkan will provide the younger Bontok uh, generation as well as others the opportunity to learn about Bontok traditions. Uh, there's supposed to be a video there. <laughs> uh, so this is a video. <laughs> So we also, uh, this illustrates how effective exhibition can actually uh, be improved no, by um, working with the communities. And um, furthermore, in this exhibition, uh, we also brought never before seen or, or unpublished photographs from Dr. Lawrence Reed, a linguist in the Cordillera, uh, who also lent us these images uh, for the exhibition. And it contributed highly in understanding the Bantok uh, culture. Uh, through these images of the Chonno that was documented in the 1960s, as well as the photographs from uh, Professor uh, Emeritus Dr. June Prilbret, whose fieldwork photographs are very uh, fascinating. Lastly, last section, reclaiming Ifugao identity. Also, uh, during the opening of the Feast of Merit exhibition at Museo Cordillera, we invited descendants of the Ifugao Kadangyan, or the affluent class, from Kiangan Ifugao to perform the Hongan di Himagabi, a ritual performed for the Hagabi, or the prestige bench, ritual accorded to the elites. One night before the opening, the 22-member group of the Ip Ip Ipas uh, arrived in the museum. The lights in the museum were still open as the curators were still working on the final touch of the exhibition. And the IPAS asked if they can view the exhibition. And we also, we agreed. And in two hours that they viewed the exhibition, I observed how they scrutinized the exhibition, touched the objects, and read the captions. And it seemed that they were pleased with how the Ifugao, their own culture, was represented via the exhibition. One even proudly ex exclaimed, Udon ni, pangat ni, 
This is ours. This is our culture. On the day of the opening, the Ipas performed the ritual of Himmagabi. Soon after the exhibition, they volunteered to be living mannequins at the Ifugao exhibition. So, uh, so this is the Ipas, uh, Ifugao Heritage Performing Arts Society from Kiangan Ifugao who performed uh, the Himagabi ritual during the opening of the Feast of Mary. Okay, so uh, soon after the performance, they volunteered to become living mannequins of our exhibition inside the the museum. So these are some of the images. No? Uh, so uh, there, uh, the traditional cost, uh, the traditional attire were revived uh, inside the Ifugao hut that we built inside the museum. Uh, elders weaving, and now the question: Who copied who? So in this uh, slide, uh, you can see that uh, these historical photographs, uh, as I talked earlier about Dean, the documentations of Dean Worcester, were actually used to revive these practices. And at the same time, the images from the archives are made accessible, allowing the Ifugaos to return the gaze on their early documenters by honoring their Ifugao ancestors through their performance and a reenactment of the bygone. Kadongyan culture. Now to conclude, today several thousand of Filipino Americans who are Igorot, who are Igorot Americans or Igorot Britons live and work abroad, a testament to the enduring result of early American colonial educational policy in the highlands. Members of this community make themselves heard through the Igorot Global Association, international reunions, publications, and dozens of internet blogs and the pride in their identity and in their cultures that connects them today draws from 100-year history. Many have come and, vis and revisited the Museo Cordillera to connect with their Igorot culture. Now, echoing my reply to the elderly woman who queried on the existence of the Igorots in this modern age, indeed the Igorots are still around, but they are no longer head hunters or dog eaters, but part of their ethnic origin. Their collective desire to practice the ways of their forebears and to uphold the heritage as a people has endured. The Igrats, wherever they go, whether they are in the mountains of the Cordillera in northern Philippines, studying in the cities, migrating in London or in Canada, or working in Hong Kong or in the U.S., and doing things elsewhere in the diaspora will often find ways of asserting aspects of their cultural identity, no matter how vague or faded, for as long as they find a link to their cultural memory. Many thanks and thank you for listening. <laughs>